Yeah, so it's my, my perhaps unexpected uh, pleasure to, to to speak to you guys today. So, um, yeah, my, my title can be sort of uh, perhaps um, uh, suspicious, suspiciously shortened to contact monoids, which sounds kind of infectious. <laughs> Fact, sort of, while we have no idea of really what to do with it, it's sort of a central theme in, in, in sort of recent, recent developments in contact topology. So. Um, yes. All right, so first, uh, a monoid is just, well, okay, if you're sort of not categorically inclined, the, the monoid is just going to be like a, uh, a subgroup of a group where you don't necessarily get to take inverses. You just take a, a subcollection where, where um, where the product of any two elements remains in that subset. So those, these are the kinds of monoids we're thinking of. Monoids that are subsets of groups. So um, in particular, sort of things like, like worrying about cancellation, those are not, not issues here. So, um, so these are particularly nice objects. Really, we want to think about them as just subsets of mapping class groups. Um, so right, the condition is just that, that, that we are allowed to compose things, or sort of multiplying. We don't necessarily have any other restriction, um, or I guess technically you want an identity, everything we're going to talk about is an identity, but that's what we're going to be thinking about. So we want to be able to compose, so subset that we can compose, and an identity. And one of the maybe sort of most naive ways you could come up with a, a monoid in a, in a group is just by starting with a presentation. So if I've got a presentation for a group, um, you could take you could take a monoid consisting of well let, let's let's say I've, I've taken a I said a non-symmetric generating set here. So I think about a, a set of letters that's generating my group, but but the, the generating set is going to be both the positive and negative powers of this generating set, and you can get a you can get a monoid by just taking the positive elements, so the positive words in the generating set. Um, no, no. Uh, I mean, as a as a subset, the the, the the set will sort of embed in there, but as a presentation, we don't require it to embed. So you don't really care if you have two words that are different in the model, you're not asking whether the group that they might be similar. Well, uh, we we sort of we're going to assume that 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 you may have sort of different. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So maybe I should. Maybe I'm, I'm being way too sloppy here. So I, what I really want to say is this is this is these are elements in G, uh, which can be written as positive words in the generating set. So we do want to think about this as as, as collapsed in, into the group, um, but we're not we're not going to worry about which present or which which factorization we've chosen. So anything that's going to have some factorization into only the positive generator. The question I was asking you know, is whether you could have uh, two elements which are different in the monoid but became the same in the group. Well, so uh, that, that is positive. If we think about them as just words, yes. then that's a possibility. But we want to think about them as elements in the group. And so we will think about them as being the same element, even though they have different factorizations, that they're written differently in terms of those words. Yeah. But then, yeah, that's a, that's a sort of we want to think about them as being elements of the group. Um, yeah. So, so actually, sort of the easiest, and, and maybe 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 the root of most of, of the later developments starts with the braid group. And if I just look at the Arden presentation of the braid group. Uh, so I'm going to think about this as a mapping class group of a, of a punctured disk where I've sort of uh, lined everything sort of vertically and all of my generators are going to be sort of half twists along this vertical axis here, right? So you've got your sort of standard generators and I don't know, let's call them A1 up to AN minus 1. And then the sort of positive monoid here gives you the things we call positive rate. So anything that, that I can write as as just positive braid half twists. That'll 
be something in this mod, right? right? And these things are sort of nice geometrically. We sort of, uh, in terms of knot theory, they happen to be fibered knots or links. Um, in terms of contact topology, in terms of uh, maybe related to some of the things we'll talk about later, these are things that are sort of, um, they bound, uh, they bound complex curves that are actually embedded in the in the in the four ball or in the three the three sphere here. So if I think about this object as being a knot inside of S3, it's the boundary of a complex curve inside of C2, and this curve can actually be isotoped into S3 uh, and remain embedded. Um, and they're sort of put into. Forgive me for. Oh, please. The, the whole reason that the, the positive monoid is so useful in the brain is that because if you have two positive words and they're equal as words in the brain group, then they're positively equal. They're equal in the monoid. But that is certainly not true in general. That's true. I mean, and I, 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 mostly because I was sort of lazy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even talk about, you know, uh, presenting the positive monoid in particular in these cases. Whether it actually does give you, a, yeah. There, there's this particular presentation in the group is particularly nice, and I'll actually mention the, your your work with with Co and Lee as well as the, the next nice example. And um, while there are lots of good applications there, I'm not going to get to any of those. But yeah. Yeah, so in fact, these are, these are uh, there's much, much more information about, about these particular words coming from the presentation rather than just that they can be written as a product of, of positive generators here. Uh, yeah. But right now, right now, this is just an analogy. And unfortunately, we're going we're gonna to stray far from this in that um, the, the monoids we're going to get to later don't have any of these nice properties and are not finally, finally presented at all. Okay, so th this is one presentation we're talking about through the early break group that you've seen before. Um, it's just got the standard generators and the uh, sort of the break relation is the is the only relation that's 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 um, that gets used here, or it's the break relations in this object. Uh, but you can also look at sort of a, a a larger generating set where I sort of uh, take my marked points and decorate them in sort of like convex polygon here, and then I take any sort of half twist along. Uh, an arc that's contained inside this, this polygon here. And this gives you the presentation that actually the Joan and, and Co and Lee worked on. So you can, you can again uh, talk about a uh, presentation that, that comes from this generating set and the positive words with respect to this thing. So again, it's, it's a, it's a cancel thing. It gives you actually a positive presentation of the monoid too, but, um, or a presentation of the positive monoid. Um, but again, there's a sort of nice geometric uh, relationship to, to work with Rudolph, where these, these are again sort of um, nice braids that have relationship to, say, complex analysis or algebraic geometry. Um, anything that I can sort of write where um, I'm allowed to, to take a positive half twist, so a right handed half twist in of my braids. But um, one way you can think about this is I would just take this point here and stretch everything out. Um, I've got my braid, my braid uh, mark points uh, aligned along the vertical axis here, and I'm taking any half twist that sits on, I'll say, the left hand side of the, of the disc. Um, so these give you sort of again bands. You do bands that presents a, a four dimensional type of surface for your for your knot or link, and um, again this is going to be a complex curve, and uh, it can be uh, embedded in, in, in S3, it can be isotoped in S3, and it remains embedded. So that, this, this is related to, to Rudolph's work. Uh, and these are called positive braids. These are strongly quasi-positive braids. Okay. So you lose a lot of, well, I guess you lose some information. It turns out these are not, well, it's so clear they're not the same grade. Uh, these are not even the same collection of knots. Um, and you can lose fiber by going from positive to strongly quasi-positive. Um, but you do maintain a lot of the sort of interesting information coming from, say, complex analysis. OK. Well, okay, so the natural generalization of this is now I just take any collection of, of arcs, and now I've got an infinite generating set. Um, let's see, okay, why not? 
So these are about finite presentations of the brain group. Now you can take a really efficient brain group where I allow myself to do a sort of a right-handed exchange along any properly embedded arc for an arc whose, whose endpoints are on my mark points here. And this gives you an infinite presentation of the brain group, but uh, it's somehow a much more natural monoid in the sense of contact topology. Um, these things are, uh, this, is, this is also Rudolph. These are quasi-positive grades. And now I'm allowed to sort of create uh, sort of immersed bands in my surface. So before I could think about actually producing a surface by, by a bunch of disks that would sort of sit off this way and connecting them by bands. This ends up being a minimal genus ciphered surface in the in the three sphere, but also sort of a, a minimal slice genus surface. Uh, same thing here, I could take all of these bands, I could connect them with disks that are sitting uh, uh, um, you know, sort of horizontally in the, in the, in the plane here. Um, if I do that here, what I end up with is something which is immersed. Uh, but it's ribbon immersed, and so it's sort of nice. So I've got a surface that's sitting in here. And again, this is a part of a complex curve. And so there's sort of nice properties with respect to, uh, say, the slice genus this is actually a minimal slice genus surface for the snot, and um, it has, has some strong relationship to, to other properties of uh, contact structures, the contact three, uh, three sphere in particular. So I guess these are, um, I don't know, maybe not the first, but sort of perhaps tracing through these threads of ideas that, that sort of lead us to, to some of the pictures in contact topology. These are, these are maybe the first monoids that, that you would have looked at that uh, you may not have called them monoids or been really sort of uh, you know, cared too much about that, that terminology, but at least the, the, you know, the brave description was, was there. Uh, shortly, shortly after, in a completely different uh, direction, uh, there, there was work by, well, I guess it was sort of an idea of Thurston that turned into a, a, a giant book by, by uh, Darren Waugh, uh, of who else, Wiest, um, uh, Rudolf, not Rudolf, um, Rolfson, and who there's a third author, or fourth author, uh, I don't remember that, uh, which is about uh, how, do you, how do you produce a left ordering on the, on the brain of the mapping class group. And this ends up being somehow a, a fundamental idea that, that shows up later. Uh, and so that's the, that's the, the next model that we want to sort of get to. So before, these are all things that come from presentations. Um, you can also get a, a monoid that comes from a left ordering. So there's left orderings on the brain group. And uh, the left orderings that I'm particularly interested in came from Thurston. So um, a left ordering is just uh, a total ordering on your group which is invariant under left multiplication. Um, the break group, you can produce a left ordering in mapping class groups in general. You can produce a left ordering using this idea of Thurston. So I take a braid, I, I sort of, I, I mark my points, I pick an, uh, a collection of arcs that runs from the boundary to, to my marked points here, and I order them. So I've got sort of, say, alpha one up to uh, alpha n here. And I'm gonna say that an, uh, an element is positive, so I want to ask. So if I, it's a it's a strict a strict ordering, a strict total ordering. So I take any any grade. I want to compare it to the identity map. So I say that something is greater than one if it's going to send the, it either sends the first uh, arc to the right. I'm doing this the wrong way. I'm doing this the contact topology way. So it sends it to the right. If it sends alpha one to the right, then it'll be greater than one. If it sends alpha to the left, it'll be left less than one. And if it fixes alpha one, then I check alpha two. So, uh, so I'm going to check is alpha is beta of alpha one to the right uh, of alpha one, then it's positive. If beta alpha, alpha one is to the left of alpha one, then it's a negative. Uh, let's say positive, negative, greater than one here. And then if it's equal to alpha one, then I check alpha two. Okay. And since this cuts us into a disk, it fixes all of the alphas that it had to actually be identical. 
So this gives you a, a total ordering, uh, strict total ordering on the, on the Brady group, and it's left invariant if you do your multiplication in the appropriate order. Um, so wait, that, that keeps going? Like if you if yes you yeah pick out alpha two then yeah, yeah. that's right yeah, like it's not enough to just check alpha one alpha two or something like that. that's right no, alpha two has to be different or something like that that's right yeah you, no. you have to check it okay yeah, right. exactly yeah so are you going to give an example of of just I don't quite understand what you mean by beta alpha one is so like the whole yeah. arc is like lines to the right yeah so oh, just if I look right here so let's do let's yeah let, let me let me draw an example of of a uh, brain so it's supposed I've traced through. Uh, Everything. Let's see. Um, I have to operate on the fly. Let's see. Okay. Let's make this this super easy. There. Okay. So I've got a I've got a four stranded braid here. If I look at that first arc, I want to ask um, at the boundary if I were to pull this taut. Is the, the angle that I would need to, to leave to, to get to my endpoint, is that to the right of where I started or, or to the left of where it fixed? Right. And really what you would do is you would put a hyperbolic structure on this and actually make these GDs make sense so, and measure it that way. But, um, but yeah, you can sort of wave your hands and just say, is it to the right? Okay. So that's, that's exactly the example here. Um, so when you do this, you get, you get a positive monoid again because of left invariance. And it actually takes the break group and chops it into half. You have the positive cone and the negative cone of the identity. Um, so this gives you a way to, to again, produce a monoid. So you take the positive cone, uh, which is everything which is greater than 1 with respect to this particular left order. Now I could chosen, you know, I, I chose these particular arcs, but if I were to sort of conjugate this whole picture, choose a different collection of arcs, it would give me a different left ordering. Um, so there's there's many different ways of getting a, uh, uh, a left ordering on the, the break. In fact, there's many that you can get that are different than this. Um, but but the ones you know, this is this is this is a particularly nice way of producing this, and you could take the intersection of all of these things. So these are sort of Thurston's left orderings. Um, and if I take the intersection of all of the positive cones of the Thurston left orderings. I get right bearing braids. You can't do that. Uh, so right bearing braid is going to be one where now if I take any any properly embedded arc or an arc with a, on the boundary uh, the boundary of the, the disk with with the second endpoint on one of the marked points, and I look again at its image under the the braid monodromy then uh, that, that image is going to be to the right. So Thurston's thing, um, you know, half of the, the braids are going to be positive, half of the braids are negative. But it's possible to have, um, have braids which are positive with respect to a specific um, set of arcs and negative with respect to a different collection of arcs. And so um, if you want something that's going to be sort of, again, geometric, that's going to be invariant of the particular way you describe your surface or your uh, or your braid in this case, which is a conjugation, then you want to do something like this. So this is something which is now going to be invariant under any sort of isomorphism of your surface. And in particular, it ends up being one of the first, uh, the first models we look at in contact topology. Okay, so this is right bearing. It sends every arc to the right of the, in, in this, uh, this, this way. To. I'm going to give you this sort of five minutes worth of contact topology uh, that, that that gets us from, uh, let's say, symplectic geometry to, to the mapping class group. Um, and it starts with, uh, well, I guess technically, historically, it starts with Donaldson. So Donaldson uh, used uh, old algebraic geometry techniques to, or maybe maybe was, was uh, motivated by old algebraic geometry techniques to to produce a sort of singular uh, vibration on a symplectic four manifold that would somehow encode the, the four manifold in, in something that was easier. So if I start with a closed four manifold and a symplectic structure, a symplectic structure is going to be 
um, something like a weakening of, of a complex structure. Really what you're getting is like the, the thing that measures when things are positive from a complex structure. But omega is going to be a two form. And the, the conditions are that it's a closed two form and that it's non degenerate, which one way you can think about this is in terms of the wedge product. Uh, it, I take the wedge product of my two form with itself, I get something which is going to be a positive volume form. And so everywhere uh, you're going to get, at every, every point in the, in the manifold, this is going to be sort of a volume form on that tangent space. Okay, so these, these end up being interesting. Um, they're related to, to, uh, to, complex, uh, to complex surfaces. Um, it's where most of the, the interesting work on, say, the smooth four dimensional longer rate conjecture has had traction. Um, and it has its roots in you know, sort of classical mechanics. But if you want to sort of build something like this, you want to you want to build a four manifold. You may want to sort of decompose it into pieces uh, and glue them together. You'd be gluing along a three manifold. And the appropriate boundary condition that you would put on this is a contact structure. So um, there's a sort of analogous definition here. But a contact structure is going to be now. Um, maybe you want to think about it as the the maximal complex line that's going to sit inside here. So suppose this is actually a complex manifold. I could take the tangent space. I could I could act by the the uh, imaginary. I could act by i here, and that would give me uh, a, a rotated three-dimensional tangent space. And if I intersected those two things, I would get an i-invariant subspace of my tangent space here. So I get sort of a complex line, and that's what c is going to be here. It's like the complex line that sits inside of this three-manifold, um, and somehow it's enough that it, it sort of gives you most of the information about the symplectic structure in your neighbor here. Um, so we often write this as the, the kernel of a one form. So C is going to be a two-dimensional sub-bundle of the tangent bundle everywhere. I'm going to write it as the kernel of a one form. And the conditions are um, that alpha wedge d alpha be positive. So alpha is going to be a one form on y. And I want alpha wedge d alpha to be positive. This is sort of the contact condition. This is the thing that's telling you that you are you are sort of rotating everywhere, which you may associate with being a contact structure. It's also what's telling you that you are not a foliation. Okay? This is the Frobenius condition. If you're going to have a, a foliation on your, your manifold, you would ask for alpha wedge d alpha to be zero. None. OK. So that's my sort of requisite. This is what a contact structure is. It's not helpful right now. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take this information and we're going to translate it into, or we won't, we'll invoke somebody else who to translate this information into to properties of the mapping class group. So uh, contact searches on three manifolds, there's sort of two kinds. They can either be um, over-twisted, which is sort of, I'm going to write easy, but it's not really true. Um, these, are, these are plane fields that are essentially determined by their algebraic topology. And so it's not, it's not the same amount of work to figure out what they do. Um, the, the sort of other, other option is there's tight contact structures, and these are sort of hard. These are, these are what are related to symplectic structures. Um, they're related to things like top foliations um, in, in some of the gauge theoretic uh, uh, invariants. That this, is, this is where you actually get useful information. Um, and yeah, so one of the big questions that we still have is, uh, take the hyperbolic three manifold, does it admit a, a tight contact structure? We sort of know all of the over twisted contact structures, it's still not clear whether it admits a tight contact structure. Um, we do know, I guess we know everything about cipher fiber spaces now, we just don't know anything about, about hyperbolic manifolds. So are there cipher fiber spaces without tight contact? Uh, yeah, so for example, if you want, with one of the orientations, uh, the pump rate homology sphere does not admit a, a tight contact structure. And in fact, the more generally, the sort of 2n, two, 2n uh, two minus 1 uh, pre scoring spheres do not. I think those are all of them. I think that's all we have. I think it's known that for cyber private spaces, those are the only ones that do not. Um, okay. All right. So tight is the sort of interesting case. And for example, if you, if you happen to be the boundary, if it actually shows up as the boundary of one of these symplectic four manifolds, then it implies that, that C is tight. Uh, 
there are other properties that, that we'll sort of look at later that, that would tell you that this thing is tight. There's also, I'm being sort of really vague about what I mean by boundary here. Uh, there's lots of different boundaries, and I'll mention some of them, but I won't go into many of the details. Okay. So, okay, so sometime in the mid 90s, Donaldson uh, produced a kind of uh, singular vibration on, on these four manifolds called, called electric pencil. That allowed you to encode your symplectic manifold as a surface plus a bunch of uh, Dane twists that would factor to give you the identity map. Where if you had a surface with boundary for electric pencil, you want a factorization of a single boundary twist about all of the, the boundaries of that surface. So in some sense, this gives you some sort of data compression. You've got some, some very uh, complicated, uh, maybe differential geometric object, and you're now, you're, now you're encoding it in terms of the, the factorization of the mapping class group. Uh, so shortly, maybe, maybe shortly, within say five years of Donaldson's work, uh, Giroux adapted this for, for contact three manifolds in terms of what they called an open book decomposition. So, uh, so Giroux, translates contact structures into open books, which I'm going to write as um, a surface and a diffeomorphism modulo some sort of equivalence relation here. So this is this is one to one if I put the equivalence relation here. So sigma is going to be a surface with boundary. Uh, phi is going to be a mapping class element that fixes the boundary of, of sigma. And uh, you can, you can use this sort of, well, you produce the fiber bundle. You take the mapping torus of this object, and you sort of close up the boundary in some way using the fact that you're fixing the boundary of the surface. So you form the mapping, mapping torus. You collapse the boundary. This gives you sort of a knot or a link inside of a three-manifold. And you can produce a contact structure by looking at the tangent pla uh, planes to the, to the surface, to all of the fibers of this fiber bundle, and then doing some sort of rotating thing as you go to the boundary of the surface in order to be able to, to extend it smoothly once you collapse. So that, the, so in fact, that, that's, that's, again, work of Thurston. If you go back to the late 70s, Thurston and Ankel Kemper showed that, uh, that you could actually, given an, an open book like this, you could produce a contact structure back when it was still not clear. I don't know if it's still not clear, but it was still an interesting question whether you could actually produce a contact structure on a sample. Um, and for higher dimensions, well, I guess we know now, but. It's, it, it's, it's been an open question for a long time whether the existence of contact structures uh, on, on higher dimensional manifolds, uh, whether, whether contact structures existed. I mean, it may not be a question anymore. Okay. All right, so the key is that, well, so first off, this, is, this relation is, it makes it kind of difficult to, to do a lot with this. Um, but what I want to sort of talk about today is that in fact that the monodromy of the of the of the open book is is essentially enough to give you anything that you would you would need. You may not be able to actually figure out that it tells you what you need, but it but it gives you everything you need. Um, Sometimes we get uh, a, a relationship between um, the monodromy of the open book and and some properties that we're interested in. So unfortunately, it doesn't tell you that if I if I take a specific uh, open book, it doesn't tell you that that's going to be not right bearing. But it does tell you that if you can find one which is not right bearing, then your contact structure is over twisted. So kind of ignore it. It also tells you that if you know for for whatever reason that your contact your contact structure is tight, then you have to be uh, have a right bearing. Did you define what right bearing was for mapping classes? Well, in general, what you have is if I take take a surface with boundary, 
uh, if I look at any properly embedded arc, and I look at its image under the monodromy, uh, I want it to go to the right somehow. Uh, something like this. So again, think about this as admitting a, say, hyperbolic structure, um, make these things sort of uh, taught in geodesics, and, and ask whether, um, whether the image arc is to the right of the, of the, of the source. And again, you, you know, yeah, it's not enough to look at just a finite collection. You kind of have to look at everything. Okay. Um, the second one comes from <laughs> from Donaldson, or or it's sort of like uh, related ideas. So going through Bellini, uh, Donaldson. And then Akhlut and Osbaji and Pandeskaya. So different, uh, you know, many different incarnations of this, this result. Which, uh, if if phi is in plus, which I'll define in just a second, then C is, in fact, I'm going to put the word Stein here, fillable. So it admits a particularly nice symplectic filling. One of these symplectic four manifolds whose boundary is going to be your contact manifold. So Stein in this case is like, a, uh, it's, a, it's like sort of a, an affine complex variety. So you still get a lot of interesting uh, you know, complex analytic or more algebra-geometric algebra constructions, but, um, but it's outlined, so it's a part to deal with. Okay, uh, Dane plus, all right. So this is the uh, sort of analog of, of quasi-positive for the mapping class group. So you take any, any right-handed uh, uh, Dane twist, and I look at, um, so all products, Right-handed things. And this is sort of maybe the only one that we can actually give you a generating set for. We don't have a generating set for rate pairing, uh, and we won't have a generating set for anything else. But this one can be sort of tell you what it is. Okay. Okay. So historically, if you wanted to show that something was tight, this was a good way to do it. You could produce a symplectic filling. Um, you could also go to gauge theory and, and find some, some invariants. So things like uh, in here, floor homology, there's a contact invariant. There's now contact invariants in Cyberg Witten. Um, uh, Eli Ashberg, Given, Tall, and Hofer have a whole army of, of pseudo-holomorphic curve invariants that allow you to tell whether something is tight, or show that something is tight at least. Uh, uh, and for all of these things, uh, this implies that it's tight. Right? Uh, fillable flight implies tight. Uh, all of these invariants imply tight. And Baldwin proved that um, you actually get a monoid from this as well. So if I think about, um, let's 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 see it easily. If I take the same surface and two monodromies. Um, supporting two contact structures, C1 and C2, then if the Oshlot Zabo contact invariant is non zero for each. Zero for the composition. So I could find some new contact manifold, which is given by the same surface and now the composed monodromy. And this is again going to be tight in particular. So if I if I if I know from whatever these gate theoretic reasons that 
that this particular invariant is not zero, I can then compose the two monodromies and I can get something which is still going to have that same property. This invariant is going to be non-zero again. So this is, this is you know, these are sort of uh, patently monoids. Um, if, you, if you look at what it means to be right invariant, it sort of doesn't matter if you, if you continue composing. It, it, it keeps pushing things to the right. Um, if you've got a product of right-handed name twists, well, I take a product of right-handed name twists, I take their product, I still get something which is a product of right-handed name twists. Um, this is something where it wasn't really clear why this should be a model, why you should be able to compose things and still maintain this property of, of being, being non-zero. Uh, this, is, this is essentially why, why everything else sort of happened. So what this tells you in particular is that OS is a model. So I take any surface, I look at the mapping class group of this surface, I look at all of the monodromies which give me contact structures where the uh, the hair floor invariant, the Oshlat Zabo contact invariant is not zero, that forms a monoid in the mapping class groups. And it turns out that that essentially any other property you might be interested for a contact structure also forms a monoid. So this is sort of the magic. Um, okay, I guess I have co-authors here, so um, while we did prove this, this exact statement, Baldwin also proved it, and it also follows from more recent stuff of um, uh, Russell. What is Russell's last name? Um, yeah, OK. All right, so um, most interesting. Properties of contact structures. Uh, I give models in that class group. Okay, and so let's say Baker, Beth Nair, Baldwin. Stock list of properties we consider interesting, like most of them. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the stock properties. So let me let me give you an idea. So we have we have all of the different kinds of fillability. So Stein fillable. Um, there's two other sort of different symplectic fillables. So strong symplectic fillability. Uh, weak symplectic fillability. Um, so the contact invariant, you could also do things like um, asking for the symplectic field theory or, um, say, cypher witten invariant, um, tight. Uh, those are the main ones, say. Uh, there are definitely, there are a few, few properties that don't fit into this paradigm, but, um, but everything that one would use to prove something is tight. And in particular, if I look at a specific surface, then I've got inclusions. Um, so beer contains everything. Beer contains tight. Tight contains weakly fillable things. It also contains all of these other things about those spots, Zabo or Cyber Witten or Split Field Theory. These are all contained in Strong. And these are all contained in Stein. And this contains. Okay, um, let me give you an example. This is also on a consistent passage. So if I take a, um, a genus one surface with one boundary component, then you can actually give a, uh, a list of monodromies that would generate um, 
uh, some of these things. So this one, this one. Don't know about this one. I think we still don't know this one. But there's at least a finite list here. So if I take the standard generating cell, let's call this A, B, then um, the, let's say the type monoid in particular is given by uh, looking at A, B, Q, B to the N, and let's say A. Uh, what do I want to say it's generated by this? You mean twists about those? I mean dang twists about those. Okay. So take the dang twists about these things. Take this word here. So I can I, I this this AB cube is like a, a half twist. It's the sort of the hyperliptic involution here. And I can take any negative power of let's say B uh, that I want. Um, I'm considering this sort of just as a as a normal set. So I'm allowed to sort of conjugate and move things around. Um, and so this guy can be really, really negative. Uh, this will give you all of the positive things. Um, and in particular, this, this can't be, there's no finite list or finite subset of this that actually generates. So this is, this is necessarily an infinite generating set. And um, since this includes into all of the other things, well, it's not immediately clear that implies that it's still not finite, but it does make it uh, less likely. No, it does. It doesn't. Yeah, okay. So in particular, this means that site is not finitely generated, uh, even normally. Wendell, we know that if the genus of your surface is zero, then um, weak equals strong equals Stein equals Dane plus. So while it's not necessarily easy to take a specific uh, mapping class element and decide whether you can you could write it as a product of right-handed Dane twists, um, at least it tells you all of these are the properties that you might be interested in. Um, it, it does not give you this or this, but um, it does give you lots of useful information. Okay. okay. Well, I guess we're going to let you guys off super easy. Okay, so I've only got a few questions here. Um, and they are sort of as open-ended as you could imagine, um, which is how do we actually characterize any of these things? So is it possible to give even an infinite generating set for any of these monoids? And on the same side, is it possible then to produce abstractions? What do you mean by abstraction? So it's to, to, to be finally generated? To be, well, not to be finally generated. Oh, well, uh, well, I guess it, it's to lying in. Or? To lying in one of these. It, I guess this this plus some, some small amount of work will tell you that that nothing is finitely generated, um, even normally. Um, but uh, but pretty right. If I if, if you're given a specific mapping class element, can you can you give an obstruction for it to, to lie in one of these these uh, monoids? So the thing is, I mean, even even testing where some, whether something is right varying is not necessarily easy, right? Because you can you can there there are certainly sufficient conditions, but um, but you know. It's not a finite process to check all of the curves, right? You essentially really have to check every curve and, and almost, and see whether it gets sent to the right or not. Uh, 
Um, you find one that you turn to the left, you can just sort of done, it's out, but you know, yeah. So you, you, you may have to check every day. Um, in genus zero, there's some nice things about the, 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 the genus zero magnifox group that you can use to say get obstructions to being in here. Um, but, you know, other than genus one and genus two, most of those things are useless. Uh, so, yeah, there's, we have a few tools, but not many. Um, and maybe just to, to keep, keep flapping up here, uh, there's also uh, analogs of a lot of these things that generalize the, um, the, the, let's say the quasi positive monoid in particular, because that's this one, one that's the most geometric. But, um, there's, there's other interesting questions you can ask about the break group that aren't those specific monoids that are, that are sort of related. Uh, but I'm all you guys who need that, so. Yes, please. 